But Lord, we worship you and we quiet our, our souls and our hearts before you because you overcame. You died for our sins. You rose from the grave. You defeated Satan, sin, and death. You paid the penalty for our sins. You took the punishment that we deserved. And it's in your victory that we who belong to you have victory, not by virtue of anything that we could do or anything that we have done. You and you alone are our hope. You and you alone are our confidence. You and you alone are our victory. Lord, I pray that you would speak through your word today to us. I pray, Father, for anyone here today who does not know you has not yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, for all of us who are here today who would say that we are Christians. Father, I pray that we would understand something very important from your word that not if, but when we stumble and when we fall, that you call us to yourself. You clean us up. When we humble ourselves before you, Father, you forgive us. And you pick us up and you tell us to keep moving along, to keep following. I lift up those who are here today, Father, who have bought lies. They stumbled and fell. They, they've blown it in, in whatever way. And they believe that somehow they are not able to be forgiven. That that's the end of their story. That they're stuck and they'll never become unstuck. Or that somehow they have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Father, I pray that today would be a day of liberation and freedom. Where people would leave here today changed because of your glorious grace. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope that you had a nice 4th of July. It's good to see you. Did you blow stuff up? Did you, did you do that? Yeah, I hope you did. It rained. You didn't do it when it was raining. I know that. Did, or maybe, or did anybody do it when it was raining? You got mad skills. You're out there in the rain blowing stuff up. That's good. I, yeah, we, we, we didn't do that. I, I wasn't able to. Uh, our neighbors did, though, for, for quite, quite some time. Um, <laughs> bless their hearts, right? <laughs> if you, um, and I, I would imagine that most here, and if you don't watch movies, that's fine, but um, I would imagine most people here have seen at least one of the 25 Rocky movies. Anybody? Okay, and there's a common theme if you notice the Rocky movies that Rocky um, and, and really the first in the first one, you know, he, for those of you who may be young or think, well, I don't know. He actually there was an Academy Award Best Picture, Best Actor, the whole thing, the first one. And it was it was really very well done. Um, and a few others were as well. But there's a common theme that if you'll notice that Rocky uh, is, is facing uh, some kind of an insurmountable um, odd. And, 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 and in this, um, he has to deal with fear. And with with doubt, and and to and for him to be able to um, to overcome, he basically has to to go deep within and summon up all of his courage and all of his strength and fight through the fear, whether it ends in a draw or it ends in uh, uh, him losing by decision or it ends with him in a victory. The point in the Rocky movies is is that you went through this, you're scared, but you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Is that is that a fairly decent synopsis? You say, yeah, okay, thumbs up. You know what? A lot of people who are professing Christians have bought into a Rocky style or a Rocky view of Christ. You've blown it. You've fallen down somewhere because we all do. We all do. Everybody blows it. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody fails. Everybody falls flat on their face. And instead of turning to the one who is gracious and loving, who will clean you up and pick you up, put a new song in your mouth and says, come on, let's go. Let's keep, let's keep journeying. You have bought into the idea that somehow 
It's like, I think it was Rocky 3 when he has to go, or Rocky 4, whenever he lost the eye of the tiger, one of those things. R 3? Thank you. Okay, so he loses the eye of the tiger, and Apollo Creed tells him, you got to go back to the beginning, Rock. Remember that? Back to the beginning. So he goes, got to back to the beginning. And back to the beginning for Rocky was that Rocky had to go back to a Spartan kind of living, a Spartan kind of training. In other words, how is Rocky going to over overcome? Is it going to be by grace or what's he got to do? He's got to face that inner demon. He's got to face his fears. He's got to work hard. Now, this is true in athletics because you won't find in athletics the oppose, your opponent going, you know what? I just want to pour out some grace on you, man. I want you to win. Beat me. <laughs> And you're not going to find that in work. You're not going to find that in a lot of realms, which is why I think so many people struggle with grace in the church because you don't have a framework for it because you think, I guess that happens here, but I don't see it anywhere else. Well, I've got good news for you. God's grace is greater than anything you've ever done and whatever you're carrying around today, no matter how heavy it is, no matter how hard you got knocked down, no matter how many times you have been whatever, God's grace is greater and he wants to clean you up, pick you up and say, come my child, let's go. And some of you are buying that lie where it's like, well, I got I to gotta fight through this myself and you get discouraged because here's the reality, you cannot fight fight through this spiritual junk in your own strength. You just can't. It's impossible. And so some of you realize that and you bought another lie. Well, I guess I'm just stuck. And you've been stuck in a moment, some of you, that you can't get out of and you've been stuck there for a long, long time. You may have people in your lives who love to remind you of all the things you've done wrong, all the times you've blown it. And who are you, good church-going person? Who are you to talk to me? Look at how you've messed up. It's quiet right now because some of you, that's where you are, that's where you've been. And instead of people in your life saying, you know what? Can I walk with you and I, and I love you and let me help you uh, walk with Christ into this point to where because he does want to forgive and to bless? I'm here to, I'm here to be that person today to tell you good news. You don't need to stay stuck where you are. If you have not yet come to faith in Christ today, you need to understand something very important. For it is by grace that you are saved. It's not by your works. You can't do a thing to earn God's salvation. So the rocky style of salvation won't work. No matter how hard you work, it'll never be good enough because God's standard is absolute perfection. I don't know about you, but I blew that perfection thing years ago. I was born with a sinful nature, so I can't do it. And neither can you. It's by grace, a free gift. And if you've fallen down and if you've stumbled and if you've bought the lie, I pray today that you will just let that go at the foot of the cross and leave here changed. There's one thing I cannot do for you and that is receive that grace for you. You must receive it. I want us to uh, turn to Genesis chapter 13. The principle that we're going to see is that after failing, go back to the beginning. Now that's where the similarity with Rocky is. Go back to the beginning, Rock. Some of us need to go back to the beginning. You remember if you were a Christian when you, when you came to faith in Christ, how amazed you were that God would love you, how excited you were that your sins were forgiven, how blown away you were that God would love you so much that he would bring you into his family and in this you rejoiced as well you should and somewhere along the way it becomes quite easy to stumble, to keep stumbling, to keep stumbling and then to get stuck in that moment you can't get out of. We're going to stand, if you would, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. We'll read this text. We're going to look at some key truths from this text, and we will um, break that down accordingly. 
So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negeb. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negeb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. You notice that? At the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were, were living in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. It's not the whole land before you separate yourself from me. If, if you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. And parenthetically, it says this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from one another. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, where at Hebron, which are at Hebron, rather, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Father, you are a gracious God. All that we have comes from your gracious hand. Lord, I pray that there would be a day of deliverance and freedom today, a day of salvation, a day, Father, in which we leave here, every single one of us changed. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. You please be seated. Thank you. So what do you do when you fail one of God's tests? That's not a matter of if, but when we all do. Do you quit? Do you buy the enemy's lies? Do you believe you can no longer be used by God? Do you think that, well, there once was a time that I could have, but I've messed up so many times I don't see how that's even possible anymore? We do fail tests. We all do. And what we do and what we choose to do after failing such times of testing is so very important. If you'll remember last week, Abram spectacularly failed a test that God had allowed him to experience for his growth. Abram, remember, there was a famine, so Abram goes to Egypt with Sarai and with their whole extended family, and he concocts this plan. And if you remember the plan, it was a plan that was all about self-preservation to the point to where he throws his wife under the bus. Hey, I want to live, so you just say this. Uh, you're my sister, which was true. She's a half-sister, and we talked about that and what that meant. We don't have time to go back over that again. But then there were unintended consequences. And, of course, if you remember from last week, uh, Pharaoh, yep, Sarai is beautiful. So he takes her in to, amongst his collection of wives. And now Abram's thinking, uh-oh, yeah, I've got a, that's my wife. And this is the ruler of the most powerful empire. And then God has to send a plague on Pharaoh's house to the point to where Pharaoh sends Abram off. Abram was uh, shamed spectacularly. He failed. He forgot all the promises that God had given him. I will bless those who bless you. I will, I will curse those who curse you. In other words, I will fight for you, Abram. I will 
before you. I am on your side, and I'm going to do something great. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. He is so afraid, he forgot everything that God had promised. And I would think that some of us can identify with that. Times of anxiety and of stress where we forget the promises of God, the person of God, what he's like. And those things become our dominant reality. Abram panicked. He schemed. And then he winds up failing this test. And we talked last week about the purpose of tests. God does not test us because he is mean. He tests us so that we can grow in our faith. We have to grow. And that's one of the ways that we, we grow. And some of us here are struggling because we have bought into this idea. We remember all the times that we have failed test after test. We don't remember the times that God's grace was poured out on us and we, we, we passed the test and, we, and, and, and we, we remember all the failures and you think, well, you know what? I don't see how God at this point could just love me or be that gracious. Here's some, here's some news, and I want you to please hang on to this. Yes, God is far more holy than you dare imagine. He is absolutely holy. He is a holy, just God. All of God's attributes come under the umbrella of his overarching attribute, which is his holiness. The only time we see in Scripture one of God's attributes repeated three times is that of his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now we see this in Isaiah. We see this in Revelation. Everything else, every other attribute flows from that. So God's love is holy. His mercy is holy. His graciousness is holy. But for some of you, you have reduced God's holiness to God just simply being perfect and, if you're honest, mean. That God runs around with a hammer over your head waiting for you to misstep. And so when you do, whack. It's like a whack-a-mole. And I say that to, to kind of alleviate the stress, but there are people who grow up with this view of God, that God is continually watching over me, waiting for me to make a mistake so we can, boom. God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. I have good news for you. God is also loving, gracious, and merciful. He is long-suffering. He is patient. God is faithful to complete the work that he began in you. God will not let you go. Were you to read all of the book of Romans, were you to read Romans chapter 8 specifically, you would see a golden chain of salvation. And here's some really good news. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want you just to write the well, challenge for this week. I dare you. Read the entire book of Romans, but that's a whole book. Oh, you can read it. I promise you. You can read the whole book. Guarantee you. Matter of fact, it will do your soul well. Here's something amazing. Towards the end of that golden chain of salvation, Paul says this, all of those whom he justified, which when you're talking about justified, which is a very important Greek word. It's a legal term. When you are saved, when you place your faith in Christ, guess what happens? Judicially, before the holy God over all of creation, you are justified. They might say, well, what does that mean? Great. I'm glad you asked. Justified, the legal term means pronounced not guilty. In God's cosmic courtroom. Sinners who have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are pronounced not guilty. You might say, well, how can that be? Because this, on that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. And when you place your faith and trust in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to your account. So when God the Father sees you, he sees the righteousness of his Son. And you might say, but I'm not perfect. I still make mistakes. Yeah, you still blow it. You still make mistakes on this side. But one day you will be free from this body of sin and death, and you will no longer struggle with that. But on this side, yes, you will wrestle. But legally, judicially, before God, you are pronounced not guilty. Now, here's the trippy part. You follow all those he justified. He says he glorified. That is referring to your eternal state. Did you notice the tense? All he glorified. Is that present tense or past tense or future tense? Yes. Boom! We've got some grammar. Yes! 
past tense. So your glorification is a done deal. You might say, well, I don't go. I don't worry. Here's what it means. You place your faith and trust in Christ. You are pronounced justified. God has already said your glorification is a done deal because in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will not let you go. He will finish what he started. So if that being the case, while we're still wrestling with things on this side, we've got to come to terms with the reality of God's grace. Because again, it's not if, but when, and how many times you stumble and you fall. And what are you going to do when you're lying down? Are you going to stay down there and listen to the enemy who whispers this kind of stuff to you? Stay down. You call yourself a Christian. Look at you. Look at them. They don't do stuff like that. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They blow it. Stay down. You're an embarrassment. You can't do this. Everybody else can. And you believe those lies. And you know what the problem is? The emphasis is on you. That's not the emphasis. It's on him. He's the one who gives us grace. So if you don't know the word of God and you're listening to the lies from the enemy, you are staying down. You are like a boxer who's been, who's got your bell rung, but you are, you are too. You've bought so many lies. You don't believe that there's a savior in the ring who's going to pick you up and say, all right, you're cleaned up. You're good. You're good to go. Let's go. It's like, no, I, I, I just, I keep messing up. I can't. Write down 1 John 1, 9. We talk about this all the time. You know why? There's a reason for it. It's not because he's memorized one Bible verse. This was written to Christians. And I think every Christian needs to have this written on their hearts and in their hearts and in their minds. And you need to know it. This was written to Christians for Christians. Okay? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you blow it, you come to him and he is faithful. You confess and what does he do? He forgives. Do you really believe that? Because if we believe that, then there would be a joy and there would be a freedom. It's like, yeah, God, I blew it. But your word says. You see, we look at Abram and go, dude, how could you? Seriously, man, God gave you all these problems. I don't get how Abram, how could you be so... We're Abram, aren't we? So we're going to do this. We did it last night. We're going to do this. I think maybe we should just do this every week. We won't, but we'll try to do it a lot. So we all know it. You can just repeat after me, okay? And you have a cheat. I didn't know last night. I was real proud of everybody. Like, wow, man, they've already got this memorized. I didn't know it was on the screen. And so I was like, we were going, so we're going to try it together. You can still read it. If we confess our sins. What? Yes, and we will work on synchronicity next week. That's the whole, the, 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 whatever you call that, right? Believe that. That is either true or it's not true, and it is true. It's in the Word of God, and if it is true, then you've got a wonderful Savior that when you blow it, you can come to Him and say, Father, I don't deserve it. Your Word says this, though, and that's so mind-boggling, and I confess to you, and by confessing, you're not telling God stuff He doesn't know. You're agreeing with Him. I sinned. I blew it here, and God says, yes, my child, I know you did, and I forgive you, and I've cleaned you up. Now go. Follow. That's where some of us, perhaps a lot of us today, we need to deal with that and go back to the beginning and leave here free. You can choose to keep carrying that luggage around. The enemy's going to tell you you have to, but you don't. You confess he's faithful and just, and you leave it. You blow it. You go back to the Father. You flunk the test. You go back to the beginning. And remember who your God is. He is gracious. That's what Abram did. I like what Warren Wiersbe said. He said, no failure is permanent in the school of faith. You might want to write that down. No failure is permanent in the school of faith. No failure is permanent in the school of faith. And that's absolutely true. God's grace is greater than all of our sins. So therefore, no failure, no failure is permanent in the school of faith. Abram failed. He blew it. He learned a huge lesson. He leaves Egypt with his tail tucked between his legs. He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. He's blown it. And he could have just come back and said, you know, you should have chosen somebody else. I am so embarrassed. My wife is ashamed of me. I threw her under the bus. My whole family saw me cower. Even my servants are laughing at me. 
Can you, can you see how this could have gone? But what does Abram do? He goes back to the beginning. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram it's inferred. He blows it. Somewhere along the way, he's asking for forgiveness. He's confessing. So he just goes back to the beginning where everything started, where he starts to worship. That's in some of us today, that's the most important thing. Go back to the beginning. Remember when you were saved. That same God who saved you, that you were so excited about, he hasn't changed. And he says, come home. I want to clean you up. He goes back to Bethel where he encountered God to the place where he had built an altar to God and there he calls on the name of the Lord is gloriously simple and that's what we must do when we blow it. We go back to the beginning and we call on the Lord who is gracious and who forgives. You see, God is far more holy than you can begin to imagine but he's also far more gracious than you dare believe. And that's where a lot of us struggle. And we struggle for a couple of reasons, I think. One, we are surrounded by people who are not gracious. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about this is culture. This is a graceless age. Have you noticed that? So you can't imagine God being gracious. Sometimes you may have people who are professing Christians in your life who are not gracious to you at all. They send a very subtle message, you made me whatever, so you're going to have to work yourself into my good graces. And some of you would say, yeah, I know what that feels like. I've had that happen. Some of you may have loved ones who love, like the enemy, to bring up all the things where you, where you blew it. Oh, yeah, you're doing fine now, but da 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 And so you get beat down, and so you start to impose these things on God. I got good news for you. God is a good and perfect father. He's not like the people around you. Aren't you glad? He's not like you and me. <laughs> That's a big amen. Because I don't know about you, but if I were God, I'd be really sick of me. <laughs> no, wait, don't answer that. <laughs> I phrased that in such a way where I just walked right into it. Yeah, like, yes. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, Right? We just can't imagine anything. And my stuff is just my junk, whatever, God, I can't. But God looks and he says, you know, again, I will forgive you. God is far more gracious. And that grace scandalizes. And people get all freaked out. And you know what's interesting to me is, is that I think that Christians are, are more prone to adopt a version of God's holiness. And by a version, I mean a, a subtle distortion of it. Where it's God with the hammer over you, right? They'll, they're, they're willing to choose that. But when you start talking about grace, you know what a lot of people start doing? Oh, slow down, stop. Because you know what their first concern is? If you talk about grace too much, people are going to start doing things that I don't approve of. They might even dance. So we need to stop that. <laughs> the Pharisees did this. You know what they did? Here's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees, because here they have the, <laughs> the law of God. They get so concerned about missteps, they start building fences around the law of God to add to it just to make sure no one can stumble and sin. And that's why Jesus says, you teach the traditions of men, not God. And we do that in our churches sometimes. So we're, we're scared to death sometimes of grace because we're afraid if we talk about it too much then people are going are to go wild and do crazy stuff. When the reality is that there are people who are dying to know, I need to know that this God is gracious enough to forgive me. Oh, turn it down. No, ramp it up. God's grace is amazing. We sing about it. If you're going to leave here changed, you've got to come and you've got to believe in his grace. Grace is not a license to sin, okay? In case any of you are right now freaking out that I'm going there. That's a misunderstanding of grace. The same as God's holiness with God as a hammer over your head is a big, profound distortion of his holiness. God's grace is wonderful, it's glorious, and it's 
free. It's free. You can't earn it. And God's grace covers everything. So some of you today, again, need to go back to the beginning and say, Lord, here it is. And he'll say, my child, great. And you can leave here free. Abraham goes back to the beginning. This is where a lot of us blow. We don't run back to God. We hide from him almost like Adam and Eve did. Remember when they sinned and they blew it and they heard the sound of the Lord their God walking in the cool of the garden and they ran and they hid. And some of us need to come out of hiding and run to our father like the prodigal did who is running to us and embraces us and forgives us and places that cloak upon us and puts that ring upon us and throws that party for us and says, my child has come home. That's how scandalous his grace is. And you know the Pharisees hated that parable. They wanted the son who stayed at home and was slaving over and all bitter. And I had a whole religious thing. I'm working so hard for you, father. They wanted him to be the hero. The hero is the father who forgives the son. They wanted the son to be kicked out of the house. And God said, no, this one saved. The one, the irony is, the one who's busting his backside, doing all this religious stuff and doing so bitterly, trying to earn the, God's, uh, the father's favor, he's the one who stays lost. Religiosity won't save you. It's not your hope. Christ is. We make this overly complicated, but some of us are here right now. I'm just praying that you would understand today that God is far more gracious. He wants you to come back to the beginning. He wants to give you a fresh start. And let's continue in verses 5 through 7. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Remember last week we talked about the types of tests and trials that we all face usually fall in a couple of different realms, circumstances, and people. Remember that? It's happening again. And Abram's, if you notice, it's happening again. This time the issue is family as far as people. Circumstances is stuff. They have too much stuff. Some of you are saying, I would like that trial. <laughs> too much stuff. Gold and silver and whatnot. This is a very serious deal. There's strife. And also there are, uh, in the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites are there. So what that is saying is, is that, so you have these people, again, who are going to be hostile. There, are, there, is all kind, there are, are all kinds of reasons for Abram to be stressed. But he has come back and he has learned something. And here's this little prelude. And as much as Abram has learned something, it will not take him too terribly long to fall flat on his face again. He's kind of like us. And God will clean him up, forgive him, and Abram will keep moving along. He's got a new problem with circumstances and people, but now he has another opportunity to walk by faith, to honor God, to learn. Instead of famine, there's abundance. Instead of Pharaoh and strangers, there's now family. So what does Abram do? Last week he schemed. He tried to game the system. He tried to preserve himself. He didn't care about his wife. He puts her at profound risk, just tosses her aside. In verses 8 and following, let's see what Abram has learned. And Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. For we are kinsmen. It's not the whole land. Before you separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Here's a few key things to notice, and we can see how Abram has grown already. First, love and family are more important than getting your own way. Abram is not thinking of himself first here, is he? Hey, man, we're family. He's not trying to, he could have played the patriarch card. I'm your elder, I'm the patriarch of this family, and so therefore I'm going to choose first, and you'll get whatever's left over. Here, <laughs> it's not worth it. He loves whatever you want. You take, you choose first. This is love. So the second thing we see here is now we see him being generous instead of selfish. Last week he was really selfish. Get very selfish. But now he's being generous. Whatever it is, you, he's trusting God. He's trusting God's goodness. God's, all this is going to be worked out. Here, Lot, I don't want any strife. Let there, let there be love in our family. You take an anger. And he's going to be content with whatever God gives him. Abram trusts God enough to say, you pick first. I don't have to bully my way to the front of the line. It's amazing to see this kind of growth. And then you look at Lot's decision, and we get some insight into him. A few things, well, there are some major differences between Lot and Abram. But there's a few things that, that stand out. One, we don't have any mention of Lot seeking God. Lot having an altar. Lot worshiping. 
Lot walks by faith. I mean, by, not by faith, by sight. By what he can see. He looks out. Yeah. This looks epic. I'm choosing first, sucker. I'm taking that. That looks great. He doesn't consult God. None of that. And if you look at Lot's story as a whole, Lot's not one who seeks God. He has what some of us have. He has a secondhand faith. He is content to live off of Abram's faith. Some of us do that too. You live off the faith of your parent, of your spouse. Sometimes you see parents who live off the faith of their kids, your friends. Well, that's good. You know, they're, they're all following Jesus and that kind of a stuff, and I'm, I'm coming to church. I'm just going to say this as graciously as I can. There is no family plan for salvation. Your whole family can be saved, but unless you personally respond to the Lord Jesus Christ, unless you are born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But my dad was, you know, I mean, you know, this is what breaks my heart. Do you know how many times over the years I've heard a testimony that goes something like this? Tell me about when did you come to faith in Christ? When did you become a Christian? Well, I was always a Christian. That's red flag number one. No, you were not. None of us were. All of us were born dead in our sins, separated from God. You were not always a Christian. So if you think that that is your testimony, if you cannot say, yes, there was a time in my life when I realized I was lost and estranged from my father, a sinner who could not save myself, and that Jesus Christ is my only hope for salvation, and I place my faith and trust in him and him alone, not my works. If you never have done that, you have not been born again. You are lost. I've heard this testimony. Well, then my, you know, my, my, my dad was a teacher in Sunday school, and he was deacon, and uh, we were real active in church. Well, when did you become a Christian? We, we always were at church. I went to youth camp all the time, and I was in youth group. And well, help me understand, when did, you, when did you become a Christian? Oh, I, I try to be a good person, you know, and you just try to, you try to live by the golden rule and, and the Ten Commandments, you know, and I try to keep those. And... When did you become a Christian? And, and the more you talk, the more you realize the person is actually basing everything on their works or their family resume. Your family resume can't save you. If your daddy was a preacher and your grandfather was a preacher, I've heard that one too. I come from a long line of preachers. Well, that's great. When did you come to faith? There's no family plan. Can we, can we, do we, does that make sense? Please, I, I need, I need, I, please look, please, if you hear anything, there is no family plan. It's not like a phone company. You know, you get your cell phone family plans, right? Doesn't work that way with Christ. You must come to him. We all must. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you've not yet done that, you must. If all your family has, you must. You can't live off their faith. So this is what we see in Lot. And then Lot's choice reveals also much about it. It says that Lot lifts up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere at the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself. Lot sees, he chooses. That's, yeah. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled amongst the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So Lot journeys east for a couple of main reasons. One, he takes the land because the way it's described. It looks beautiful. So he didn't even stop to pray, think, pursue, ask God anything. It's like, that's the best. I'm taking it. There's also a city nearby. You remember we've, we've talked about when Abram is called that he and his family are city people. And so he's looking at this going, this is so great. I'm so tired of this wandering and drifting around and then going into foreign countries. I'm going to live near a city where there are walls, where there's protection, the things that I know. And this is where Sodom and Gomorrah is before the Lord destroyed them. And there is that ominous warning. The men of Sodom were weak, uh, wicked, rather, great sinners against the Lord. And we'll get to that story later. Uh, 
uh, in the sermon series. And that wickedness includes what we know, but also an awful lot more than you probably do know. It's in the scripture, and we'll take a look at that. That city was depraved. That area was depraved. So when God judges, he does so justly. But Lot is drawn to that place at this time. The cities are nearby. This is good. He's not learning from Abram's mistakes in Egypt. He never asked God anything because it never crosses his mind to do so. And how many of us live our lives that way day to day? We don't even ask God. We just do. It doesn't even cross our mind. Lot just sees and makes the decision and goes. And it will be a very costly decision. So now we go back to Abram and God and as we close. Once more, God speaks to Abram. Abram, the same Abram who blew it, the same Abram who went back to the beginning, the same Abram who starts to seek the Lord, and God reassures Abram. You'll notice at this point in the story, if you notice that God has reassured Abram several times of his promises, he's a gracious and patient God. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you. Does Abram have to earn it? God's going to give it to him. And to your offspring forever, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land. In other words, go check it out. Walk everywhere, for I will give this to you. That is God's grace. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, where, which are at Hebron. And there, what do we see him doing again? He built an altar to the Lord. He worships. Once again, Abram, I'm going to give all this to you and your offspring. I know you don't have a child. I don't know have any offspring right now, but, but I'm going to give all this to you. Abram, can you count dust? You can't, but guess what? That's what your offspring is going to be like. There are going to be so many you can't even count them. And through Christ, that is true. We are all his spiritual offspring which is amazing. Abram has no child, and he's believing all of this. He's, he's, he's receiving God's grace and God's forgiveness, and God goes so far to affirm once again, I have good for you, Abram. You see how gracious God is. God didn't say, well, you know, Abram, if you mess up one more time, we're done. And that's where some of us are, because you think, I already crossed that line. I messed up one more time too many. God assures him. God reaffirms to him, Abram, I've got plans for you. And Abram believes it. That's what faith is. Hebrews 11, 1 says what? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith trusts God and his promises. And in this moment, Abram believes. This is what we're called to. Our Christian life is a life of faith. We're called to trust God for all things and in all things. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that's really hard. But it's what we're called to do. And when I blow it, God forgives because you come to me and say, Father, please forgive me. I blew it. And he says, I know. And again, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he picks us up and says, go. We struggle with faith. We'll trust God with one thing, but not another example. You'll trust God with your eternal destiny, and in some ironic sense, you won't trust him with your present reality. Right? Yes, Jesus is getting me to heaven. The problem's today, man. I don't know if he's going to come through. Come on now. You'll trust him with your family, but not your finances. Or you'll trust him with your finances, but not your protection. Or I'll give to the church, but I'm not going to engage lost people. That's just way too intense. You'll trust God to give you grace to serve, but you won't trust him to vindicate and protect you. You see... I mean, we're, we're faced with faith decisions daily. We have so many promises in the Word of God that God calls us to stand on, to appropriate, to cling to, even when everything around us may look contrary. I guarantee you, if Abram was walking by sight as he looked out, he could have said, man, you know what? Th these other people groups are still in his land. You're supposed to give me. And again, I have no kid. We just left Egypt. That worked out horribly. That would have been a lot of us, right? So now I'm back here again, and you're telling me this is all going to be mine. I don't get it. I'm walking in circles. I'm just going to sit until something happens. 
but he doesn't. He goes back to the beginning and he knows this God who called me out is good. And God gives him a fresh start. Those fresh starts are available for people and for churches. They're available for you. They're available to me. Are you willing to come to him today to lay whatever it is you're carrying around down? If you're lost, his grace is great enough to save you today. You don't have to work into a certain state to say, okay, now I'm good enough to be saved. No, you'll never be that. None of us will. But as offered as a free gift, today can be that day. When we stand and sing in a moment, we're going to have a time, it's a call our invitation time. I'm going to ask that you please don't open the door just for three minutes when we sing. The invitation is not just a formal liturgical kind of a thing that we do where I stand up here for my own, you know, jollies or whatnot, and then John sings a song, and we kind of like, you know. This is a continuation of worship, Okay. So if you're here today and you have not yet placed your faith and trust in Christ and you want to know, how do I become a Christian? I want this relationship. Please, I know it takes courage, but please leave where, you are, where you're standing and singing. Just come up here and say, yeah, I want to become a, a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Leave here today changed. If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where the Lord wants you to be, just come forward and say, yeah, I want to plant myself here and be on mission with you people. Whatever that looks like, we'll set up a time to meet. Or maybe you just want to come up here and pray and say, Lord, I give you this stuff, whatever this stuff is. I'm coming back to the beginning. I'm leaving everything here, and I'm going to leave here different because you're a gracious and good God. However you need to respond today, let's do so by saying yes to him. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Father, <laughs> you are holy. And you're loving and gracious and merciful. And Father, I thank you that you are patient and long-suffering, God, because uh, frankly, I know I need that. I need your patience, Lord. We all do. Father, I ask and pray that during our time of invitation that each of us would respond to you as we should. For those who do not yet know you, I pray that today that they would just give themselves to you and trust you in faith. For those, Father, who maybe have bought too many lies or are isolated or just feeling that they're, they can't be forgiven or that they're washed up and they can't be used anymore, I pray that those lies would just, Father, dissipate in light of your grace and that today they would be free. Father, I just ask that you would help us to worship you today and leave here with a sense of great joy that you are so good, so wonderful, so loving that you would do such miraculous things in the lives of people like us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.